Hello, Living Word family. We are glad that you've joined us on YouTube. We want you to be a part of this message that touches your life every day. So on behalf of Pastor Pierre, my wife and I, we are glad that you engage. We want you to subscribe because there's so many messages on here that you could listen to on your leisure. We are glad that we're able to serve you. But we also want you to go to our website. When you go to our website, you will find a lot more information, even the sermon outlines. And also, you can provide an opportunity for you to see a list of our materials, books that you can look at that meets your need, and you could share with other family members or friends. We could also give. As you give to Living Word, you know us. When you go to our website and you do that, we use those funds to serve the agenda of God for the glory of God, and that allows us to serve you effectively. So we're glad you're here with us. Subscribe, be a part of this, and I pray you join us again and keep involved as God so leads you so that we grow through these times and are coming out of it better than we went in. Thanks for allowing us to serve you. God, we want to say that we desperately love you. We thank you for the opportunity to get into your word. My prayer is that everyone's hearts are ready. Um, we could do a lot of things in our own human nature, but one thing we can't do is grow on our own. Um, we could do a lot of things in our human nature, but one thing we can't do is expound upon your word in a way that will impact lives without the Holy Spirit. So God, I submit to you humbly. I ask that every word that proceeds out of my mouth will give you glory. I ask that everything that I do or say will be edifying to your people, that it will build up your church, because at the end of the day, this is your word. So God, I am excited about what, and you, what, what you will do in your word through your people for the people that are around them as well. God, we want to say we love you, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, well let's do this. I've learned a couple things, and as y'all know, I am the best planter in my house. Yeah? If you've been at church long enough, you know I'm multifaceted, multi-talented. Well, one, one way is how I take care of all the plants. Yeah, um, Monica, doesn't, Monica doesn't do it. I do it. Now, that's my first lie of the day. We'll keep going. But this Christmas, this, this season of freezing, my wife... Obviously, being ahead of me and obviously better than me, she was like, well, what are we going to cover the plants with? Now, I'm going to start by saying this. I, I'm trying to grow in that area, but I admit that I'm a pessimist that they going to die anyways. Like, I truly in my heart believe that them comforters that we've wasted and throwing on the ground don't protect nothing. Because as soon as we take the comforter off, they still did. Okay? That's just my opinion. Now, I still do what my wife says, but I'm getting better at it. One thing I know is that my wife, being better at it than me, she's like, oh, well, you got to wrap it around the roots. I'm like, okay. And then after you wrap it around the roots, then the pots that were outside, she, she says, well, we got to move those potted ones inside. The roots aren't deep. And I said, oh, okay, so we pick up these heavy pots full of dirt, only in America, and we move them on the inside. Now, excuse my Pierreisms. I just find it odd that I have to take care of a plant that's supposed to be outside. That's just me. But what I do know is the roots aren't deep enough, so no matter what comforter you throw on top, it's definitely going to die. But sometimes you might get stuck in the belief that you don't deserve to get moved into the inside or you don't want to move at all. What I guess what I'm saying is that God has a tendency to move you because he already knows your roots ain't ready. That God has a tendency to say, no, you're going to be an indoor plant because you ain't ready for 20 degrees. Now, some trees are going to make it. As you know, their roots run deep. They're getting a little bit more warmth from the earth's core. But for us that think we're ready to be outside, God is saying, if you trust me, let me move you. The problem, though, is that if you believe you're deeper than you think you are, some of us tend to argue with God about where you're supposed to be. 
And some of us make moves way too early, and God is saying, you weren't ready to move on the inside either. Just wait on me to move the pot. Today, you're going to discover a story where God is in charge of movement. However, when he's in charge of movement, he's often in charge of the results. Because when he moves you, he has a plan. But sometimes we can get ahead of that plan. Sometimes we can take the plan into our own hands. But God is still sovereign and faithful even when you do something out of order. I want you to turn to Exodus chapter 2 with me. We're going to dive into a text that my prayer is you will see the beauty of it. And in the beauty of this text, you're going to realize how good our God is despite the beginning. And now while you're turning there, I want you to understand something, that we're in a part where your leader, Moses, just killed an Egyptian that was picking on the Israelites, and he just committed murder. And when Pharaoh found out, Pharaoh says, hey, I'm going to come get you, and then Moses goes on the run. In Exodus chapter 2, you can start in verse 15 if you would like. When when Pharaoh heard of this matter, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from the presence of Pharaoh and settled in the land of Midian and sat down by the well. See, I love a narrative because a narrative is always going to set you where you need to be. He did something on his own and tried to deliver somebody by using his own human power. And when he did that, he used what he was trained to do, which was to kill. As a soldier, he used what he was trained to do to think that that was going to help and deliver the person or the people. So sometimes what we have a tendency to do is that we use our training from earth to think that we're going to do a godly purpose. That some of us got our education and said our education is going to accomplish a godly purpose. And God's like, no, no, no. What I do on my timing is through my training and what I want. And when I'm ready to use everything that I've developed in you on earth, I'll use it when I'm ready. I got to ask a question. How many of y'all right now are starting to use your human nature to fix your problems? Only to murder something in the progress. That some of y'all have even tried to fix your marriages by using your techniques from your one psychology class in college. That some of y'all went and took, you were a minor in psychology, and now you are diagnosing your husband and calling him a narcissist. And God is like, hey, when I'm ready to move, I'm not going to need your psychology class to do it. And in the process of you using your human confidence and strength, you are killing things in the way. And when I'm ready to send you back into Egypt to be a deliverer, I would have told you that. But you try to do it all on your own. Now, I appreciate the fact that you have a passion for it. Now, pay attention. I appreciate the fact that you want to deliver your people. Just do it my way. I'm going to tell you something that is quite odd, but it's something that I think is worthy of conversation. I find it odd when people try to do God's work and sin in the process and then say, to God be the glory. How are you going to murder somebody to free God's people? That's a sin. You can't murder somebody and sin at the same time and say, God delivered you. Obviously, it didn't work out because now you're on the run. Now, what I guess I'm trying to say is that some of us will do sinful things and then try to give God the glory for your behavior. The good news out of the whole story is that God already knew you would commit that mistake and already had a sovereign plan for your life. So even in your sinful nature, which you're bound to do, he still has a plan to use you despite your sinful results. Now, I'll be honest, the run God already had a plan for. So now you have what we're picking up in this text. You're picking up where Moses has already settled in Midian. He's already gotten away from the danger of Pharaoh. He already had to run again. He went from the Nile. Now he's what? He went to Egypt, or excuse me, he was in Egypt. He went from mama's house to Pharaoh's house, and now he's in a Midian sitting by a well. Now you would think he's all alone. He's nothing to do, and you would think he would be downcasted. He would say, I'm never going to help nobody again. And this is where the story to me takes a beautiful turn, because I would have been like, I ain't helping nobody again. Every time I help somebody, I end up running. And that's what many of us have said. That's why some of us aren't serving in church today. You ain't helped nobody in three years, because the last time you did, it didn't turn out the way your heroic mind made it up. But right here, We have Moses sitting by a well directly placed at the perfect time 
exactly where God wanted him anyways. Can I tell you that even though some of us are on the run does not mean God lost sight of you. How many of you right now feel like you're on the run? Like you feel like nothing's settled in your life. Like you had a vision for where you were going to be by age 30. And that vision makes you feel like you are still running around from career to career, person to person, relationship to relationship, job to job. And and God is sitting there saying like, just because you think you're on the run doesn't mean I don't have you sitting where I want you to sit. Now sit. The hardest thing for us to do in America is sit still. Even when you sit still, you have a phone in your hand. So even when you're not supposed to be doing anything, you are doing something with your hands. Watch what happens when you just sit because you have nowhere else to run. There's nowhere else to go. And he's safely at least dwelling in Midian at this point, or at least sat there. And he says right here, it says, now the priest of Midian had seven daughters. And they came to draw water. And in the historical prevalence, I want you to understand something that you would say, why is a woman drawing water? Well, first, he only had seven daughters. And the seven daughters often would go to the well to draw. You would not find that in the New Testament when the woman was at the what? The well to draw. So this is not uncommon for a woman to be at the well. However, if a man runs into her or a shepherd runs into her, they will often disregard the woman. They will often push the women to the side and say, you're going to have to wait for me to finish. This is exactly what's fixing to happen. That the shepherds are going to mistreat the seven daughters. But Moses is there. Watch what it says. And they came to draw water and fill the troughs to water their father's flock. Then the shepherds. So he's already in Midian. He's sitting there. And God's already doing the prep work through Egypt in his training. And now he's sitting by a well where the shepherds are already coming to do what they do best. And the shepherds came and drove them away. Now, can you imagine seven daughters getting kicked out? Hey, get out. The shepherds came and said, hey, we're going to do our flocks. You can sit here and wait for us to be done and drove them away. But there was somebody there with the training already given that's fixing to stand up and do something different. Some of y'all might be thinking your past is a waste. How many of y'all would think I ain't even used my major? I'm over here in a whole nother career. Some of y'all are sitting there telling me you don't understand. I went to all this premarital and it still ain't working. You never know when God's going to draw on the well of what he's put in your past. You have no idea what God is going to use and when he's going to use it. Your job is to what? Respond to the opportunity God allows. So before we even dive into the text, I don't want people while they're on the run to believe that God wastes what he put in. That some of us are in the belief right now that God is wasting away your life. And he's like, no, no, no. I just know when to use it. But then I'm going to ask you a hard question. Stop using it when it ain't the time. It ain't your job to figure out timing. It's your job to respond when God gives opportunity. Some of y'all are forcing time rather than seeking opportunities to serve and to use your gifts. Watch what happens. He says, and then he says, he came and drove them away, but Moses. But Moses stood. Now the word stand didn't mean he just stood up. It means he kind of bucked up. And I kind of like it a little bit because it's always a good time to put a thug in a story. I'm sure he looked a lot like me and all of my thuggish ways. That's why Monica liked me. She said I look like 50 Cent. I mean, in the early 2000s, of course. Not now, 50. But he stood up. Now, I want you to understand that stood up doesn't necessarily mean that he just stood up and said, hey, guys, stop. Now, that's what I would do. My dad taught me to use my words. Hey, stop it. Stop. Why are they not listening to me? I'm going to tell the teacher. My dad had us tell him the teacher, y'all. You know how hard it is? My dad said I couldn't fight until I told the teacher and the principal. Man. All right, moving on. (laughs) They stood up. But the best way to define it is he stood up in defense of. Now, let me ask you a question. How many of you would stand up and defend somebody 
if you just stood up and defended somebody else but end up having to run because you did it? Can you picture how hard that is for Moses to stand up and do it again, even though you're sitting by a well because last time you stood up, you got ran out by your own father-ish figure? See, y'all didn't realize how much depth there was to the fact that he just did it again. I guess what I'm trying to say is just because you did something and it didn't work the first time doesn't mean that God won't use it the second time. But some of y'all have not moved, served, used your gifts, or talents, or what God has put inside of you because somebody, when you did it the first time, somebody hurt you, mom, dad, etc. And God's like, whoa, just because somebody and even you messed up the first time because you ill-timed your first time and you sinned to do it doesn't mean if you don't sin this time, I'm not going to use it. So let me ask you this question, and I hope this buries deep into your heart. What have you not been using all because of your past pain? What in this church could be, what part of the hand, the body of Christ is missing because some of us aren't moving until somehow God put 16 fleece out. And God's like, but I already gave you opportunity. Will you stand up for somebody else other than yourself? Let me ask you a secondary question. Do you notice that if I was Moses, I would have recluse, wouldn't have you? That some of us would go deeper into, I'm going to preserve self. Last time I tried to help somebody, oh, man, I got ran out of town. I ain't helping nobody else. How many of you are not standing up for other people because the last time you did it, you got hurt? How many of you are not helping your marriages grow because you said, the last time I tried to help, she cut me down. He cut me down. I'm not helping him no more. But watch what happens. He stood up. But he did what he was trained to do. And it said he stood up and helped them, but Moses stood up. But then we also know the word stood up means to, we're going to find out later, means actually to fight. So now he stood up and did Pierre. He actually stood up and started to squabble a little bit. But I want you to understand that it was one on some. It was one, Moses, and there were shepherds, plural. Now, can you imagine being as good as me in a fight? Could you imagine knowing that I'm outnumbered, but yet it don't matter because his hand's that good? So he stood up. But then it says something else happened after. Because if I would have fought on your behalf, I'm not going to help you water things later. But he went above and beyond. I, I, I have come to the conclusion that Christianities are more selfish than they've ever been. That I'm not going to go above and beyond. The best I'll do is use what I got to help you for that moment, and I'm gone. But God is saying, no, no, Moses not only stood, but then he watered their entire flock. Now, you got to get the picture. It's not like they had three sheep, and he just gave them a little cup of water and then walked off. He watered their entire flock. That means he did the work of seven daughters. So not only did he fight off shepherds, plural, when he was done fighting all of them off, he then watered the entire flock. When is the last time your faith slash your abilities, what God has given you, has made you water or somebody else's flock for free? See, everybody wants to be paid for God's service is what I'm trying to say. What am I going to get out of helping you? But when is the last time you said, hey, I'm just going to water the flock because it's best for you. And I'd rather do it because I'm here and I know how. It keeps going. He was successful. He was better this time. And this time he didn't murder nobody. This time he still helped. And this time he still did what was better. Talk about learning from your mistakes. The problem is... I want you to understand now, a couple of things I want you to pay, on, pay attention to before we talk about him starting to sit down somewhere. So first he's on the run and then he gets this opportunity and then he's fixing to sit down somewhere. But before he sits down, pay attention to a couple words that will come back later. One is that he drew water and he watered flock. I want you to see the full circle movement of God. And then he delivered people that weren't his. Why is Midian so important to the story? That wasn't his people. It's going to come back in a second. I, uh, getting back to planting, I love planting. You know, I told y'all I love plants. But when the plants are finally done, my wife tells me something. She says, hey, they're ready to be put in the ground. So I go out there with my shovel, 
and I dig a hole deep enough where the roots can grow deep, and then we cover it back up with dirt. It, she says, hey, the pot has done its work. Now it's time for those plants to sit down somewhere. I guess what I'm trying to say is that when God tells you, hey, the pot has done its work, it's time for you to move and sit down somewhere, my prayer is that you actually stay there. We have a lot of people that like to move around but never settle. And right now we're going to discover where Moses said, hey, this is the opportunity God's given me, so I'm going to sit and I'm going to let my roots start to dwell here until God moves me again. How many of you have come to church seven years in a row but have never joined, all because of your past pain? How many of you are dating around but never married, all because the last thing didn't work out? How many of you are divorced but have given up hope and be remarried one day because you're saying it'll never happen? And God's like, just because you have been uprooted doesn't mean I can't plant you somewhere else. Right here. But you would think, it says, so they said, an Egyptian. So watch what the father asks. So when they came back to Raul, well, pay attention. His real name is often called Jethro. You'll come back in the story. Pay attention. Their father, he said, why have you come back so soon today? So pay attention to this real quick. That means the girls or the women, excuse me, were used to waiting for everybody else to finish. And they would always take longer to fill and to feed their flock. But because Moses did what he did, they came back earlier. So the father looking at all seven daughters walking the house, he's like, hey, where'd y'all come from? And how'd y'all get it done so fast? I love this because that plays into it because they said this. This one hit me. So they said an Egyptian delivered us from the hand of the shepherd. This is why I know we, he got into a little bit of a squabble. And what is more, watch these words, he even drew the water for us and watered the flock. What I tell you, he did what? Above and beyond. Watch what Jethro says back. He said to his daughters, where is he then? This is the crazy thing about Jethro. Jethro like, wait, wait, hold on, hold on. So you telling me some man did all of this for you? And y'all didn't bring up, you didn't bring them back? That's one of y'all's husbands. You just missed an opportunity. <laughs> That's your Boaz. Uh, you know. <laughs> Better uncover his feet. <laughs> no, nah, I'm not, I'm just joking. I'm making that part up, obviously. But there was something about Eastern what? Culture is that if somebody helped you, you actually what? Invited them to this thing that everybody holds sacred, your house. What? Like people, people get to come to your house? Yeah. And he was like, but why? How in the world could somebody do all of this for you and you not invite them and have hospi hosp hospitality back? Oh, watch this. How many of you in your hearts right now feel like you're not going to help nobody else because when you do, they forget you did it? Isn't it crazy that people will take your blessings and run with it? And guess what all seven daughters were? They were like, thanks, gone. And they're like, man, work day cut short, and they left. But just because somebody runs away with your help doesn't mean somebody else won't remember it. See, just because, uh, just because you think they left you at the well doesn't mean God is not going to bless you on the back end. See, here's the kicker, and this is the reason why I love this story so much, is that God is still faithful to your story. And even if people forget what you've done, doesn't mean God has. And secondly, don't do something so that they will remember you. Do something because God equipped you to do it in the first place. We have too many reciprocal relationships inside the church. If I do something for you, you do something for me. That's called a transaction. But that's not how God works. I do something for you because God told me to. And if I do it, it's because God trained me and equipped me to do it. That means if I got the gift, I'm going to use it. That's like me saying, hey, it's not until y'all give, I'm going to start preaching. Is that just a 20? Oh, you ain't getting no word today. <laughs> now, everybody line up and get your preaching money in. Sow your seed. Sow your seeds.
That's, that's not how we preach because we're called. You pastor because you love. You don't do it to get something back. We all know you don't pass it to get anything back. Show sure enough. We just get good and good, good job, good and faithful servant. You can come on in. You were like, man, you sprinkle a little blessing on earth. I've seen so many people stop helping people because that person doesn't bless you. But it's not up to the person to bless you or remember you. It's up to God to see your faithful service and reward you however he sees fit. The reason why some of us are become so selfish is because we only serve to get something, either from God or that person. And we even do it transactionally in marriage. I give you something, you get something back. That don't work like that. That's called selfish love, and sadly, that's an oxymoron. Watch. Invite them in. They didn't forgot the man. He says, he said to the daughter, where is he then? Why is it that you have left the man behind? Invite him to have something to eat. Now, pastor said at first service, when you invite somebody to eat in the Eastern culture, he also was, gonna, he was also saying, you're going to stay here for a little bit. Let me see you. Now, I don't know if pastor's right or not, but it makes a lot of sense because that's exactly what happens. He says what? Come eat. But that man Moses never left. Pastor said at first level, he said, the food must have been good. Now, if I was Moses, I'd be like, who really cooking? Because that's the one I want right here. <laughs> oh, you just bringing out dishes? I don't want you. Come, come here, Zipporah. <laughs> that's exactly what happens. Moses was willing to dwell with the man. I would too. This boy getting fed every day. And then Jethro, knowing the man he saw as the defender of his daughters, he gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses. Now, pay attention that every person in the story is going to end up having a role later. So what Moses thought was on the run actually became a place where he found his wife. Isn't it crazy that some of us right now, you single folk are out here running to somebody rather than running where God wants you to go? And God's like, when you think you're on the run is exactly when I give you the person you need. Stop being scared of movement. And for all my safe folk out there, all the people that don't like change, sometimes change is exactly what God is asking you to do. Some of y'all have not left a job in six years knowing you underpaid. And God's like, you can move. God, why don't you bless me? He's like, if you moved, I would. Stop being scared of the movement that God creates. And also, stop being scared of the people that God brings in your life. If he brings them in, he might have a purpose. But if you're the protector of your own circle, then how do you know who God's bringing in anyways? Some of y'all have friends from 1992, knowing they've been trash. And God's bringing in new friends from this church. And you're like, not you. I still have a friend. We go drink on Sundays. Just keep. Y'all want to keep missing your Sephora's. Sephora's. Sephora sound a little bit dark skinned. <laughs> Come here, Sephora. But this is when the story gets good. <laughs> so y'all stop laughing. Y'all know it sounded a little like Sephora. Well, when you get married, something happens. Then they gave birth to a son. They did something to get the son. The son is born. But watch what Moses says when the son is born. This is where the story gets good. For he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. Moses finally got the story. But this word sojourner, actually has historical meaning. That the son's name actually has historical meaning as well. That it means that I am a stranger and I am in foreign territory. Some people would disagree about this meaning. 
And I'm not going to lie, you can see it both ways depending on how you see the verb placement. One person would say that he feels like finally he has a home to call his. So now he has a wife and he has a son, and now I'm going to call this place home, but I was always a foreigner in Egypt because I never belonged. That's a beautiful take. If you reverse the word choice and you say, no, he's saying I'm always a foreigner because I had to go from Egypt and now I'm in a foreign land again. Either way, he finally realized that he is always on the move and he always is a stranger. Now, there's some theological principles we're going to pick up in this text right here, just in this word alone. Because this preparation of him realizing that he's just a traveler, that he's just somebody that is moving, but watch some other connotations that he says, I'm always in a foreign territory and nothing that I have is permanent. It's somebody, watch these other connotations. I know this is one I'm sticking on. It says that is one that is always driven and one that is always thrust forth. That means he knows now that he's always either driven out of something or pushed away to something. Oh, it gets better. It means that he lingers, but he still keeps traveling. And that he doesn't belong even where he is. If you don't mind, I'm going to take that same word and I'm going to apply it to the spiritual walk of your lives all throughout the New Testament. But for some reason, I'll be honest and transparent with you, I think America has taught an anti-messaging and we've fallen for it. That you know and we should know that you are just a pilgrim passing through. That you are just a foreigner in a foreign territory. In America, slash your life on earth is a temporary stop because you are just a vapor. But for some reason, America slash Christianity has taught you that this world is all that matters and your life for 80 plus years is the only thing that matters. Treasure up, get storehouses, get your money right, get your jobs right, get your home right. And God's like, but I'm just using you as a pilgrim to do my work while you're in a foreign territory because one day you will be in a new land, a promise that one day your real home is in heaven. So why are you holding on to things so tightly if you're just a sojourner? The reason why some of us are so caught up on what you have is because you think that's the only thing you'll ever get. The reason why some of us have held tight to what you have earned is because first you believe you earned it in the first place, and second you think you're supposed to hold it forever. And God's looking at you saying, you're just a foreigner. I even put it in the New Testament. You are a pilgrim passing through. You are just a a breath in the scope of eternity. The question I have is, if that's who you are, then why aren't you giving everything you have to God while you're here? Because one day you will live with him in eternity, and he already tells you in the book of Corinthians that he will recompense you for everything you did while you was passing through earth. Recompense means reward. We're more worried about earthly rewards, and that's why churches are filled with people coming to church to be blessed on earth. And God's like, your final blessing is in your final resting place. I think Moses finally got it. There ain't no home for me. No matter what take you give, I'm, I'm that guy that always finds the final take. So you can even talk about it, and you can argue if you want theologically which verb placement you like. But at the end of the day, he realized something. I don't belong anywhere. I wish the youth were in here because they would finally realize you making the varsity team is not that big of a deal. Y'all remember when we used to wear letter jacket, letterman jackets everywhere? Everybody in here had Philippians 4.13 on the back. <laughs> but that meant the world to me back then. Y'all remember? We were stunned. It'd be hot and we'd be like, letterman jacket day. Because <laughs> we felt like that made us what? Belong to something. And I ain't here to talk about none of your AKAs and alphas and omegas and zipperas and all these other people. But we go to college just so we can what? Find our place and belong somewhere. Some of y'all still pay alumni fees right now. Just because you feel like you belong, they take your money and give it to somebody else. You're like, I still got to be faithful. And God's looking at you like, oh, that's cool. But you ain't giving tithes in like six years, though. I was moving on. 
It's not a tithe sermon. But I ask and I plead that you will start holding your life as if it's in God's hands and not yours. Even your marriage is his. Even your singleness is his. Like, stop holding it like it's yours. But then, finally, it gets to the beauty. And this gets to the end. But I want to connect some pieces for you. I told you we would come back to some words, and I meant it. There's three things in this story that foreshadows to who he becomes. So remember I told you the first point is on the run, you're still getting prepped by God. Remember I told you that even while you thought the training was a waste, it's never a waste. And even this middle part where you thought you finally settled down and God moves you again, all of that has purpose. Watch the words that matter. The first thing is that I told you he shepherded the flock, didn't he? And even where he settled, he settled where somebody had what? Flock. That means when he stayed with Jethro, he ended up helping Jethro with what? His flock. And if you know anything about the Midianites, I told you they come back into play, is that the Midianites were known to move. They would settle and they would move. And they would settle and go find the land they needed and they would settle again. So my point is what? All the while he thinks, man, I'm always transient. I can never settle down. I would love to have a man. I would love to have a woman. Why can't I finally settle down? And God's like, every movement I have provided for you is because I have a purpose for your life. What did Moses end up shepherding after all of this ended? The people that left Egypt with him. The same thing he tried to save by himself, he is now shepherding millions of people. And guess what he has to do along the way? Water them. Y'all remember he got a staff, right? And even in that staff, he made another mistake because he stepped out of order and did it in anger and finally hit that rock, right? We noticed that Moses might have a little temper problem. And even in that, he ends up what? Watering the flock of Israelites that were helpless, had nobody to protect them but one shepherd who had a stick. So don't tell me that God is not in charge of your life when he's in charge of every move, even the moves you thought were mistakes. And every time you keep moving, that's the crazy part. You're thinking, God may not see me here. I feel lost here. I wonder even why I'm here. And God's like, every move you made is so that when you were walking around in a desert, you never felt lost. You know what I love about my seasoned saints, and hopefully they understand that this is not a knock, this is the beauty, is that after you look back 80 years on your life and you start, man, that stop makes sense. Even this mistake is not to make sense. Even this thing makes sense. Even this problem I thought was lasting me forever is starting to make sense. I always say hindsight is 2020. And for some of us, I wish the younger people would hear the older people's testimony that don't get so caught up and anxious over your current circumstances and forget that God is going to use every part of your journey along the way. That the problem is, is that we hoard our testimonies, which only proves God's faithfulness. But if younger people will be able to hear some of the seasoned saints' testimonies, they'll be able to calm your anxiousness for you to know that even if you feel lost, God ain't lost you. He's still faithful. You know who does that all the time? My dad. And it's going to come across like a joke, but it's genuinely in seriousness and appreciation. Y'all know y'all's pastor, man. He teaches at every opportunity. Shoot, he just introduced and did the announcements, and you still got a mini sermonette in that. But one thing as a son I could take away from all his stories, how faithful God has been to my family, our family, throughout this whole 30-year journey. Like, I don't have to guess about it. Because my dad consistently tells me, hey, this stuff? Boy, you better learn this now. This stop, boy, I learned a lot right here. This, I'm like, man, I, but you already told me about this stop five times, but it's okay. Because I can tell you right now, I'm reminded all the time that along all our family history and journey, God has been faithful to it. So to my younger saints, 
Stop questioning God just because you don't like your stop. And start saying, wherever I am, I'm going to take that opportunity to serve God. I'm going to stand up, stop sitting down. We don't need no more pew sitters. We got enough of them. Stand up and do something with what you've been equipped with and burdened with. Because somebody is waiting on you to defend the seven million night daughters. You know what I love about counseling students? And I gotta, I'm trying. Is that sometimes, you know, with counseling students, and I have a couple that are in my life because I'm at the seminary, and they say, you know what? I went through so much trauma in my life. I just want to walk along somebody who's going through the same thing. And they often make the best counselors because they're compassionate and empathetic. And now they went back, got the tools so they can help somebody else with the tools they didn't have. That may be your life where God, you're like, God, why did I go through everything? God's like, I just equipped you so that somebody else, some Midianite daughter won't go through the same thing. Hmm. Some of y'all said amen, but I'm still waiting on Titus 2 to really happen here. Where older men and younger men will get together and talk about what it means to be married and be a husband and be a father and be a servant of God. And then vice versa, in Titus chapter 2, it says your older women get together with younger women, and they start to tell them what it means to be a wife and a mother and how to be a non-gossiper and how to have character. Like, that is what it should be. But we have a lot of Christian hoarders who like to hold on to their stories, hold on to their experience, and never use their equipment. Moving on. Not only was he a shepherd of the people, he was a deliverer. Remember I said, this Egyptian delivered us. Do you notice that he used his Egyptian background to make sure he knew how to go back into Egypt? Let's start there. Both words play, meaning he was an Egyptian. That means he also knows what it takes to go talk to Pharaoh because guess who he was attached to is Pharaoh. Pharaoh, now pay attention. He didn't want to be with Pharaoh in the first place if you know his Bible story, his baby story. He wanted to be with mama. But he had to be stuck with Pharaoh. So it makes it, the conversation at least has to happen because my son is coming to talk to me, or my grandson's coming to talk to me, by what? So Pharaoh's now what? Willing to talk. Willing to have conversation, not kill him on sight. Think about this. God even set up the fact that some of us and the people we've grown to hate are still a part of your story. The people you thought were to blame for your trauma are still a part of your way of making a way for somebody else. Like, here's the crazy part I can't understand. If you didn't have a father, be the best father you can be. Because even the absence of your father, you learn that you need one. But for some reason, we have people who grew up without fathers that end up abandoning their children. And I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. If you know what it feels like, be the best father you can be. Ladies, if you know what it feels like not to have the love of a father, why would you marry somebody that has no father characteristics? At least say, man, the trauma from my childhood won't be repeated. I would say that every part of your story is a part of God's deliverance. Because guess what they called him? The Egyptian delivered us. Then what did he end up doing? I can give you text after text. Exodus 18 refers to him as a deliverer. Then you got the salvation that is in verse 17 as well, the same chapter, saying he was a part of God's salvation for us. So the same word they use in chapter 2 is the same word the author uses in chapter 18 to say, I trained you to deliver people. You did it wrong the first time. You did it right the second time. Now you know what to do when I send you back to do it again. The question that I struggle with is that some of us have not gone back to Egypt to help anybody else. Some of us have gotten the education and the equipment, even a little savings account, and you will not go back to Egypt to help somebody else. Who has God put in your story and in your journal and in your prayer time that you have cheapened it just to pray for them without doing something about it? That some of us are like, I won't pray for you, bro. Do something. 
Walk with them. Take them out to lunch at least. Hear their story. Be a part of their story. At least try to do something to go back to the people who are still enslaved with their sin and help them cross the Red Sea. At least play your part. But some of us have been a part and supposed to play a part in somebody else's salvation, but you are too selfish to, and you hoard all the things God has blessed you with and you never give it back. If God made you a shepherd and he made you roam, make sure somebody knows where they're going when they're lost too. And just because you're young doesn't mean you can't do it. He was a deliverer but it was on only on God's timeline. Now, the second part of people are rushing back to Egypt only to kill people along the way. And God's like, wait until I send you. That took a burning bush. But I pray you at least respond to a burning bush. How many of you have heard sermon after sermon after sermon? And you know that burning bush has been talking to your heart every sermon. And you still go home and do the same stuff. Second service, can I be transparent? I'm so thankful for Pastor's vision and the fact that he started second service. For the young and for the elders, it doesn't matter. But the point is we started it to keep people in mind that will be the future of Living Word Fellowship Church. But if all we train here at second service is people that are coming to take and not give, we are going to die in 10 years. For some of y'all, you are the future of living word. But if all we do is make this entertainment, we've missed. Like we're going to start a second service life app. And we know we're going to start small because who wants to stay during football season? We literally had to have a conversation about staying because football's on. Because that's the generation we fool with. We fool with a generation who comes one Sunday and misses the next three. Who is more concerned with absorbing content than actually dispersing it to help people. But you didn't come here for that. Not only was he a deliverer, not only was he a shepherd, but the last part is he put the people in the story came back into play. Jethro and Zipporah both came back. Jethro helped him shepherd better. So now father-in-law comes back and says, hey, brother, you shepherding all wrong and you're going to wear yourself out. So somehow God introduced the characters in the story that would one day help Moses not die while trying to help people. So I guess what I'm saying is everybody should be willing to listen to who God brings in your life. And I started reading the book of Proverbs, and I pray that you understand this last point. It's in the book of Proverbs, he keeps talking about somebody who receives wise counsel, somebody who receives wise counsel, somebody who receives wise counsel. And if you just read the book of Proverbs, you would realize that we have too many stubborn-hearted people that are not listening to the Jethro's that God put in your life. Like some of us are making mistakes on purpose because you know you ain't supposed to do it. And God's like, but I gave you Jethro so you would listen to him. Meanwhile, you don't listen to him because they're just your father-in-law. I, I struggled this morning and not in the way you think. But if you know my story, you know that I don't really like to pick clothes out. So I just put my, my suits, every time I wear them, I put them at the back of the closet in the, in the suit rotation. That way I just don't wear the same suit twice because I forget week to week. So this one came up. And as you could tell, it's a struggle. Because I bought it when I lost all the weight. But then I gained some of it back. And it's a struggle because I can't bend my knees, y'all. <laughs> I haven't bent my knees all morning. You know, the pants too tight when you bend your knees and the whole back come down. You're like, oh, man. <laughs> because I didn't wait until I settled into my weight where I would be. I bought because I was excited. 
I bought because I was like, yo, this is it. This is what I'm going to be for the rest of my life. And God was like, no, you're not. I ate one piece of bread and they didn't fit. I guess what I'm trying to say is some of us start to fill up our closets when we think this is where we're supposed to be. Some of us start to buy things and settle in and try to say, this is my home. This is my new boo. I know it is. God told me in a dream. Some of y'all said, this is my job for the rest of my life. And God's like, no, I'll tell you when you're settled. Stop settling in until I say this is it. And be okay with what I say is it. If not, you're going to be walking around places with too tight of clothes on and can't bend your knees. <laughs> my prayer for you is today, if the pot has to move, move with it. If you have to wait in your excitement to buy your clothes, wait on God. Because he has not forgotten you. And he's faithful even when you're moving around. Let us pray. We are excited that you have joined us. And I pray this message touched your life. We pray that you enjoyed it. We pray that it impacted your heart. And we hope that you would subscribe and continue to grow with all the messages that are here. You can find a sermon outline. So we're glad you enjoyed it. Look forward to you coming back so we grow together. Thank you for blessing us and for blessing your life by allowing us to serve you.